So uh, 15 years ago, I was working in the advertising industry in London, uh, promoting products that I didn't believe in or clients who didn't really appreciate it. Um, and I started to ask myself, you know, what am I really doing with my life? And that questioning um, turned into an existential crisis. And the existential crisis blossomed into a full-on nervous breakdown. And at the age of just 25, I ended up um, unemployed and clinically depressed. And at my absolute lowest ebb, uh, I was in my flat and I looked around at the different objects in my flat. And I thought, the table is useful because you can put things on it. And the sofa is useful because you can sit on it. And the TV is useful because it can entertain. And I'm the only thing in this room that has no purpose or use whatsoever. And it was, it was a devastating thought. Um, and I tried everything um, ranging from acupuncture and psychotherapy through to antidepressants and faith healing, um, and nothing made any difference. Um, until one morning, I got a random phone call from a family friend offering me the opportunity to volunteer my marketing skills to a farming project in the Gambia. Um, having never been to the Gambia, I can't say, or also Africa in fact, I can't say the idea appealed. Um, what occurred to me as a, a passive consumer of the media over here, um, what occurred to me about Africa was disease, poverty, uh, civil war, corruption. Um, and I thought, no, thank you very much. If I'm going to be suicidal, I'd much rather do that from the comfort of my own home. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but thankfully for me, my friends and family had other ideas and they put me on the aeroplane. Um, and just a matter of days later, um, I rocked up in, in a country that's known as the smiling coast of Africa, clinically depressed. Uh, <laughs> And um, it's something of a miracle in my personal life that after six months of um, uh, seeing nothing but darkness, it took just two weeks in the warm embrace of the Gambia to come back to life. Um, and instead of staying for uh, six weeks, I ended up staying for four years um, and running a social enterprise, working with small scale farmers. And during that time, uh, I witnessed firsthand the, the abject failure of the aid model for development in rural Africa. Um, and I learned that um, what these farmers needed more than anything was really quite simple, which was a market. Um, so we would have a bumper tomato harvest one week, and then I'd go back the following week to the, the very same household, and I'd find that the kids who weren't in school were now in school. You know, just like that. Um, or they were building an extra room on their house so that the whole family didn't have to sleep in the same bedroom uh, or in the same bed. Um, and this just felt really good. And I started to think about how can we take this impact and really scale it up? Um, and the answer came uh, in the form of a humble African fruit called baobab. Um, so uh, hands up in the audience if you've heard of baobab. Okay, that's great. So I knew that you were my kind of people. So <laughs> I'm in a good place here. Um, uh, so for those of you who, um, who haven't heard of Baobab, yes, it's, it's that tree from The Lion King. Um, and uh, as it turns out, 99% of the population um, has seen The Lion King. Um, and then, <laughs> of course, um, there's uh, The Little Prince, um, which is, uh, in fact, the world's best-selling children's book. Um, but my personal favourite is the one on the right, um, which is the World Cup opening ceremony in South Africa. And they bought uh, the African flags from all four corners of the stadium. Um, and they constructed this magnificent um, multicoloured baobab tree. And the announcer said, this is the mighty baobab, the giver of life, the symbol of Africa. And then a little door opened up in the baobab tree and R. Kelly came out. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> he was wearing an all-in-one black leather jumpsuit with cut-off mittens. Um, <clears throat> and the moment was somewhat ruined, but it was stuck in the mind. Um, 
Um, but if you did know that about the baobab tree, you, you may not know that it has a fruit. Um, so it does have a fruit. Um, and it's not just any old fruit. So um, baobab fruits uh, dry naturally on the, on the branch, um, creating a uh, nutrient-dense uh, powder, which has six times the vitamin C of an orange, twice the calcium of milk, six times the potassium of bananas. It's almost 50% fiber, uh, and it has the highest antioxidant of any whole fruit. And inside that fruit pulp are also seeds, which are uh, containing a, a very vitamin uh, and mineral rich oil, which is perfect for use in cosmetics. Um, so if there is such a thing as a superfood, this truly is it. Um, <clears throat> but even more extraordinary than this tree and its fruit is the inspiring possibility it represents for rural Africa. So these trees grow in the driest, remotest, harshest, and hence poorest regions of Africa. Um, there's no such thing as a baobab plantation. So every single tree is community owned or family owned and wild harvested. And we estimate that there are 10 million households uh, in 32 different countries in Africa who can supply this fruit from a crop that already exists and currently goes mainly to waste. And National Geographic estimated if there was a global demand for baobab, this exi uh, existing crop could be worth a billion dollars to rural Africa. Um, <clears throat> so um, there's only one thing that's standing in the way of that, which is that 99% of people outside of Africa have never heard of it. So what would have to occur for this inspiring possibility to become a reality? We would have to actually manifest that demand. We would have to create the market um, or in other words, we have to make Baobab famous. Uh, and this has been the purpose and the mission uh, of, of my business for the last seven years. Um, and to start with, to be honest, nobody was interested. Um, and, uh, but after six months um, of hard work and persistence and some cool packaging, we finally got it into uh, the kind of perception driving, trend setting retailers in London. Um, and so we thought, you know, great products, lovely packaging, um, great retail partners, job done. Now we've just got to sit back and watch it fly off the shelves. Right? <laughs> Wrong. Um, so I think in the, uh, the first two months, we only sold 10 units uh, and I bought one of them. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I think my mum bought the rest of them. Um, <laughs> and we were questioning whether this was scalable. Um, so uh, we realized we have to do something radical or the whole thing is going to fail and forget about a billion dollar industry. We wouldn't be able to create a thousand dollar industry. Um, so we recruited uh, 10 uh, volunteers who were inspired by the mission of kickstarting a health trend in London that would ripple worldwide and cause this new market. And thanks to them, we took it from being in danger of being delisted to being the best-selling superfood in London. Um, and then we took that case study to Holland and Barrett and said, look, we've made it the best-selling superfood in these stores in London. Now we want to replicate that nationwide. Um, and they said, yes. Um, but we very soon learned that driving rate of sale in a national retail listing uh, is no joke. Um, and again, you know, we had a poor rate of sale, we realized that if we don't do something dramatic again, this thing is going to fail. Um, and it was then that we learned about uh, the uh, Virgin Voom contest, it's a, a national entrepreneurship contest, uh, and the prize, uh, if you win it, is a quarter of a million pounds marketing campaign. Um, so with 48 hours to go uh, of public voting, um, our campaign to make Baobab famous went viral. Uh, and we finished in the top position. Um, got the opportunity to pitch directly to the great man himself. Um, and there's a, the money shot of him cradling the baobab fruit, <laughs> which was, uh, will probably be engraved on my tombstone. Um, <coughs> and um, yeah, um, actually, you know, went, was able to go back to um, Holland the Barrett, you know, having had a large check 
Um, and uh, in, in, in February of the, of the following year, Dreams became reality and we rolled out the campaign nationwide with um, a window takeover of all 750 stores. Um, and but you know, Baobab front and center, almost every high street in the UK um, created a transformation and awareness of Baobab within the industry. Um, and this is a real life Baobab miracle. For the six weeks of the campaign, they actually changed their name to Holland and Baobab. <laughs> and I promise you, this is not on the rate card. Uh, this is not a negotiable thing. Um, <clears throat> probably will never be repeated. And this was Facebook, Instagram, Google+, YouTube, all digital channels. Um, uh, so over the course of six years, we've taken Baobab from complete obscurity to being a trending superfood. And as of just last week, um, we, got, uh, we went live in Sainsbury's as part of their Taste of the Future project. Um, and I've left uh, really the very best till last here, um, which is during this whole process, we've been working in partnership uh, with a local community organization in Northern Ghana. Um, and uh, the communities where we source Baobab from, um, the women's cooperatives, these are subsistence level communities, i.e. Uh, there's no formal employment um, these people live on the land um, and they have a five month rainy season in which they have to grow as much as possible in order to store or barter during the seven month dry or hungry season when these, uh, these families uh, and these women don't know if they can actually feed their families. Now, this baobab crop arrives bang in the middle of the dry season, um, <clears throat> which is the most vulnerable time of year. And this is, uh, this is not like a small increment on their existing income, you know, like a fair trade premium or something. This is an entirely new revenue stream at the most vulnerable time of year. And we're seeing household uh, increases in household income of up to 10 times. So this is actually transformation. Um, so this year uh, we have uh, sourced more than 300 tonnes of baobab from uh, a thousand plus women. Um, and um, yeah, it's, you know, this, this work really, really works. Um, however, we're currently sourcing from just 35 communities and our local partner in Ghana estimates that in Northern Ghana alone, there could be as many as 8,000 communities who could participate if the demand was there. So, um, the importance of this value chain uh, has now been recognized by the UN. Um, and as of last year, we got um, uh, secured a strategic partnership with them um, and uh, including some grant, uh, some grant funding as part of their Great Green Wall project in which they're seeking to re-green and transform the whole of the Sahel. Um, so uh, with their partnership, we're scaling up uh, the Baobab supply chain but baobab is just one ingredient of a number of plant-based, ethical, sustainable, regenerative ingredients and functional ingredients that we are working on making commercially available. Um, so um, in order to scale up the supply side, we also have to scale up the demand. Um, and that's where I'm hoping that some of the people in this room might be interested in getting involved. So with the UN, we've created uh, and we'll be launching uh, the Great Green Wall Sourcing Challenge. Um, and we're inviting uh, major corporations, uh, food and beverage, personal care, to get involved in the co-creation of the pilot phase of this Great Green Wall Sourcing Challenge, um, by which we will plug in uh, hundreds of thousands and hopefully millions of small scale producers in the Sahel into sustainable global value chains. Um, and so with your help, we can ensure that this really is just the beginning. Thank you.